Okay, so yesterday, um, the first couple slides were all review, um, stuff that we've already had the first two units. Here's where we got into kind of the new stuff. The idea that um, we're looking at the nucleus, and in the nucleus we have the protons and the neutrons. We know that protons should repel. They should push apart. They are re repelling, but there's something that overcomes that, and that something are the neutrons, okay? And that's the, there is a force called the attractive uh, nuclear force or the strong force, and that is what is allowing the protons to um, stay together even though they're naturally wanting to kind of repel and push away, all right? And so we can think of the neutrons as kind of being the thing that neutralizes this repulsion or this natural um, pushing away that the protons will do because of their like charges. All right, so the neutrons are kind of like the glue, they're kind of like the neutralizer. Um, it allows the nucleus to be held together. The thing that interrupts that is if you have a nucleus that is really, really large. All right, and so that large nucleus is not able to, the neutrons aren't able to be sticky enough basically to kind of hold that nucleus together to be able to keep the entire thing stable. And so when that happens, it starts to decay. And so decay doesn't mean rotten, it means it, it starts to fall apart, right? And so it breaks off into chunks. So you have, you know, a chunk of protons and neutrons and another chunk, and it just kind of breaks apart, okay? And so this is where we left off with number eight yesterday. So here's a quick review to start us with today on slide number nine, what are the two particles in the nucleus? What are those two subatomic particles? <clears throat> What's the nucleus made of, Gilbert? Neutrons and which one? I can't hear. Good, neutrons and protons. Okay. And then, Kenna, what charge do the protons have? They're a positive charge. So you can just put a plus sign. And what charge does the nucleus have then? Brady? No charge. Oh, uh, wait. What negative. Negative. Why? Uh, because electrons has, uh, have the negative. Because they. Uh, they do? He's like, wait a second. But are they in the nucleus? No. No. What's in the nucleus? Okay, so they have no charge. What else is in the nucleus then, Layla? Protons. Ethan, what charge do the protons have again? So what charge by default does the nucleus have to have? Has to be positive. Now, are there negatives in an atom? Absolutely, all right? But if we're talking just that nucleus, that is positively charged, okay? So both the proton and the nucleus have a positive charge. So what was that, I'm trying to, I think that was kind of a weird name, um, goes by different names. What was that um, force that holds the nucleus together? It's the strong force. It can also be called the strong nuclear force. Sometimes it's called the attractive nuclear force. Um, any of those are correct. If you want to just put strong force, I'm fine with that, um, as long as you know you understand what that means. It, I think it'd almost be easier if it would just give it a name. Like, I don't know, just make something up. Like, why doesn't it have its own unique name? It's a very important thing. It's a very important force. Um, I don't know. It is the way it is. It's like you can't change it just because it's kind of awkward. Um, but that's what it is. The idea behind it is that it's the neutrons that are kind of like the glue that holds it together. That is the, the force that is able to overcome that repulsion of the protons, all right? And so can the attractive nuclear force hold together a really large nucleus or nuclei? Nuclei being the plural of nucleus. If you have a really large nucleus, can that force always overcome that repulsion? Correct, right? 
not usually able to. It can hold small and medium sized nuclei, no problem, but when it gets really large, its force isn't, isn't strong enough. And that repulsion takes over. Good. The attraction isn't strong enough. Or, I mean, really, the repulsion becomes stronger. Either way, it's the same kind of idea. We have this strong attractive nuclear force, and it can usually keep the nucleus intact. But when it does not, that's when the nucleus decays, and it starts to give off matter and energy, and this process is known as radioactivity, or something is radioactive if it's going through this process. And we'll watch, um, we have a song in a brain pop that we'll watch towards the end. And so this can happen with large or small nuclei kind of naturally. We talked last year about carbon dating, um, where the isotope of carbon, carbon-14, will, um, you know, give off that radiation that we can measure. Um, and so we'll look at that a little bit more later this unit. Um, but what we're going to focus on right now is these large nuclei um, they can actually be kind of induced to start to decay if they are um, kind of bombarded with, with a, another neutron or something. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Sometimes it happens naturally. Sometimes we can make it happen. And so typically it's these large nuclei that are unstable, meaning the nucleus is so big that the strong force isn't quite strong enough to keep it intact anymore. And those are the ones that are going to start breaking down, or we call them decaying, and giving off that radiation. Okay, and so we're going to hear this term decay used quite a bit. Um, and it's used to describe what's happening as, as the nucleus of an unstable isotope changes. It is not being destroyed. It is not rotting. It is not like disintegrating and like melting away, right? It's nothing like that. What it is is basically it's the protons and the neutrons just like rearranging and kind of splitting into smaller um, nuclei. And so again, don't think of it as rotting. It's just rearranging itself so that it can get stable. It's like having a giant handful of cards and you have all these cards. It's like, oh man, if I could just get rid of a few, like take you know half of them and move them over here, then you could hold what's left between your two hands easily. That's what kind of what's happening. If you could rearrange the number of protons and neutrons and split them into two different nuclei, then each nuclei that's formed can be stable on its own now. Okay, so that rearranging means the number of neutrons and protons are changing, giving you a new element for the first time because we are now changing the number of protons. So up to this point, we said protons are permanent. You can't change protons. And you still can and keep the same element. You can change the number of protons, but now you have a different element. So isotopes and ions are the same element. That is the same thing. It's just a different version of it. If you get to the point where you have a nucleus that's unstable and it starts to decay and splits into two nuclei, well now you've changed the number of protons, now you're dealing with two new elements from an original what they call like parent element, all right? So um, the proton number can change, but when it does, you're dealing with a whole new element now. All right, so this is usually the case with elements that have an atomic number of 84 or higher. Um, they, their nuclei are considered unstable. Why do you think 84? Like, why not 8? Why not 20? Why do you think it's up into the 80s before this starts to happen? What do you think? Yeah, it's too big. Great. 
They have too many protons and neutrons, right? So if they have 84 protons, they probably have at least 80 some neutrons, if not more, because most of the time neutrons are kind of close to how many protons you have. It's not an exact number. Um, so you're talking about a fairly big nucleus. And so that strong attractive force can't keep that whole thing together, right? And that's um, why it is considered unstable. They have that large nuclei. <clears throat> and when you get up to about 93 protons, these are elements that are so unstable that they, we don't even really find them naturally on Earth. They can be um, created synthetically or reproduced in the lab, but they are so unstable, they're not going to be found naturally. It's kind of like our alkali metals. They react so quickly um, because they're so close to having their valence level full um, that we don't, that they are usually not found alone. They're always, almost always have reacted with another element to form a compound at that point. Um, and so, if, you know, if, if there is an element that is 93 or above, it breaks down or decays so quickly that it doesn't last, and so we just don't really see them, um, you know, without us helping them along a little bit. Okay, I have a couple of examples, um, and when, and this is actually, I got it from a video that we're going to watch here, um, here in the next day or two. Um, when I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes really good sense. So it usually helps people. Um, let's say you're carrying um, two boxes or a small stack of boxes. You probably can maintain control of that, right? It's kind of like a small nucleus. The protons and neutrons are able to stick together. The neutrons can neutralize the repulsion of the protons and keep the nucleus nice and tight and together. Think about carrying a large stack of boxes, like way high above your head. You're carrying it, you're trying to balance it, you're trying to keep them from shifting and sliding. That's a little bit more difficult. I would consider this more of an unstable-like load, right? Well, same thing with a large nucleus. The nucleus is not able to maintain total control of, of the proton's repulsion, and so it's not able to keep it sticking together. Right, so the glue basically for the neutrons is not strong enough to overcome the repulsion of those protons. Right, and so if you have this visual in mind, that might help. You can keep it stable for a little bit, probably carrying it, but like one little twitch or one little bump or jostle, and it's gonna it's gonna you know fall over. And so that represents our large nucleus. And so here's another example, sorry, food, right? Think of a popcorn ball. This is kind of the time of year a lot where you, where you see these. If you, has anybody ever made popcorn balls at home? Usually they're like the size of a baseball, maybe softball at the biggest. Why do you think you don't make one like as big as a basketball or a, like be like have this big one, like, you know, oh, I can really like tear into this thing. Why do you think? What do you think, Justin? It would be hard to hold it all together. It would be hard to hold it all together, right? I, I, I've made it before, and I can't barely keep the small ones together, right? They're sticky, but like to keep them maintained, it's a hard thing to do, right? So you keep getting bigger and bigger, it just kind of breaks into chunks and like it falls apart, right? And so if you think of the, a small popcorn, popcorn ball, um, it's able to stay sticky enough to maintain that circular shape and keep it all together. Well, you get a real big one, they're not going to be sticky enough to hold the whole thing. Now, you'll have a chunk here, maybe a chunk here, and another chunk, but you're not going to be able to keep that whole thing intact. And so that's like a large nucleus. When it starts to break apart, that's what we call the decay process. That nucleus is decay. Now, think of that popcorn ball. It's still the popcorn ball. It's still our protons and neutrons. It's just now in smaller chunks. Well, those become new nuclei. So if you had this big popcorn ball and you had it break into like three chunks, well, each chunk could be your own new individual popcorn ball that would then be able to stay together. Okay? And so um, that's kind of the process. If it's too large, it will break apart, forming something new. So it's just rearranging those protons and neutrons. I didn't blow this up. I didn't destroy it. 
I didn't change um, you know, the protons and neutrons. I just changed which ones were together. Right? And so if you think of both of those two examples, hopefully that will help. All right, so this is another quick review because these numbers are going to be important to us again. So the atomic number is the number of protons. Our mass number is our number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So the atomic number just counts the one thing in the nucleus. The mass number counts the two things that are found in the nucleus. And we know that in a neutral atom, protons and electrons are equal. But we know that neutral doesn't always mean stable either. And so if you, um, it always goes back to those valence electrons that we learned about in uh, that very first unit. Again, it's not always the top number on your little tile in the periodic table. It's not always the bottom number. You have to just remember that the mass number is going to be your large one and that your atomic number will always be the small one. Easy ways to remember that, right? We had a couple cheats, and so we'll look at those again um, in a minute. Um, so the atomic number is the one that can't change because it represents the protons. If we change that number or the number of protons, we've changed elements. We can change electrons and have the same element. We call those ions. Again, we're hoping to get to at least like 99% of everybody being able to identify ions as changed electrons and isotopes as changed number of neutrons. Um, this is not new information. Just trying to kind of hammer it home. All right, so here's carbon-12, and here's carbon-14. It's still carbon because it has six protons, but carbon-14 actually has two extra neutrons, which is, makes it different, makes it the isotope version of carbon. All right, we um, had a couple cheats for atomic and mass number. The atomic number is the smaller of the two. It's small like the atom, so it's the small number. And then it only includes protons, and so you're only counting one part of the atom, giving you a smaller number than if you counted two parts. So if we look at um, blonde hair versus brown hair, if I only count people with blonde hair in here, that's going to be a much smaller number than if I include people with brown hair and blonde hair. And redheads would be a whole different thing. Sorry, you two. <laughs> She is not thrilled with me. Mass number. It's going to be the larger of the two. It is massive, so it actually has the word mass in it. The mass over the big one has the word mass in it, and that's the mass number. And this is counting the protons and the neutrons. So counting two parts of the atom definitely is going to make it a bigger number, just like including two colors of hair. Oh, I could do it this way. We'll do blonde and redheads. Still, if I count blonde and redheads, that's still more people in this room than if I just count blondes or if I just count redheads. Okay. You feel better now, Veronica? You feel included? Huh? Oh, backwards. Okay, and then our final idea here is there's no number of neutrons on the periodic table. Right? We have an easy way to find that, but there's no number that I can just look and be like, oh, carbon has this many neutrons. The reason why is because there's so many isotope versions of the elements that our table would be like a whole book long. Like it'd be huge. So we just have to have a method of figuring out what our number of neutrons is. And it's simple. Um, we, oh, back to this real quick. Um, we name the isotope by its mass number. So you say carbon and then whatever its mass number is. So carbon 12 or carbon 14. Um, so whatever the mass number is, that identifies the element as well. But to determine the number of neutrons, all you have to do is subtract your atomic number from your mass number, which is basically subtracting your protons from your protons and neutrons, and it leaves you with neutrons. Where can you find this information in your binder on something that you've been using all year long? Where do I have the same pretty much exact thing, Nevea? Yeah, yeah I, it's in one of my handwritten little air bubbles on the periodic table. Okay. 
So it's not something you have to memorize. It is something that is always there, readily available for you. All right, so we're going to stop there and have to go to the brain pop to start us here. So go ahead and put your notes away, but make sure you're giving your full attention up front still.